Hey everyone, this is Nick Van Acker. I'm the Science on a Sphere coordinator at the MSU Museum, and I'm excited to bring you guys another Science on a Sphere virtual show. So you might be feeling a sense of deja vu if you tuned into the program last week. Uh, last week's program was, was about fossils, and this week's program is as well. This is going to be kind of a fossils part two. So if you didn't tune into last week's program, uh, we covered the history of the Earth. We looked at a data set called PaleoMap that covered 750 million years of the Earth's history. We also talked about some different ways that fossils can form. And so this week, we're going to look at that same data set, that same paleo map data set, but we'll be looking specifically at Michigan, and then we'll be looking at some Michigan fossils that you're able to find in Michigan. Uh, so it should be a pretty cool program if you're interested in fossil life here in our Great Lakes state. If you haven't ever tuned into a program with us before, you might not know that you can actually follow along with us at home, and you can do that using the Science on a Sphere website. Um, so the Science on a Sphere website is sos.noaa.gov slash datasets, and I pulled it up right behind me here. Um, so if you go to this website and then you go to the land tab, which is the brown box with the mountain in it, um, you can scroll down to the paleo map data set. Um, and that's going to be looking at how the continents have moved and shifted over the last 750 million years. And it's going to look something like this. You can see this looks like a pretty typical drawing of the Earth. But when you watch the data set, you'll see that the continents all move and shift throughout history. And uh, the main thing you can get from this really is that nothing in the history of the Earth is constant. Uh, rocks are constantly going to be moving around and shifting and changing. And in fact, there's constantly going to be new layers of rock that have been added to the surface of the Earth over the history of the Earth. So looking at how all the continents have moved is one way to study the history of the Earth, but there are actually a couple of other ways as well. And one of those ways is going to be looking at the layers themselves. So I have a diagram right here next to me that shows all the layers of the surface of the Earth. So this is all of the rocks that you might see that were laid down over the history of the Earth. You can see they start out 4.6 billion years ago when the Earth forms and were laid down layer and by layer by layer over millions and millions of years until eventually we get to the rocks that are being laid down currently in the present, all the way up in the Holocene up there. So this is another great way to look at the history of the Earth, and this is usually the way that paleontologists do look at it. Um, they look at things in terms of layers. Um, the great thing about the layers is that when something dies and gets fossilized, it gets laid down in a particular layer that's being laid down at that time. So if something's getting fossilized right now, something died a couple days ago, um, it is slowly in the process of being fossilized to be discovered millions and millions of years later, um, it's going to be in the Holocene layer, which is our current layer. If something died 443 million years ago, it would be in the Silurian layer. So these layers are a really great way for paleontologists to know what was alive when in Earth's history. And of course, like we covered last week, not all of these layers are always going to be present everywhere on the Earth all at once. So we can look at a map of Michigan and see that only some of these layers are available in Michigan. These all are the layers that are on the surface um, and they're available on the surface by being weathered away by things. Um, when the glaciers came through, they scraped a lot of stuff up. Um, and so different areas of the earth are going to have different layers exposed, which is how we find really cool fossils. Um, it's the reason that you'll find dinosaur fossils out in the West, but you won't find any in Michigan. Um, you can see the layers that are available in Michigan right here next to me. Um, so we have some fossils from the Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, uh, Mississippian, and Pennsylvanian, usually. Um, there are other fossils that you can find in Michigan, and we'll be covering those as we go through the history of Michigan today. So we can get started. Um, we're going to start at the very bottom of this chart and start at the very beginning of Michigan's history and talk about all sorts of different fossils that you might be able to find in Michigan and that paleontologists have been able to find in Michigan. Um, and so we're going to be using the PaleoMap data set to do this. So we'll start at the very beginning of time for the Earth, but at the very end of the data set, um, which is going to be the Archaean period or what we might call Precambrian. Um, so for the PaleoMap data set, that's going to be 750 million years ago, um, but it's basically anything before the Cambrian period started 542 million years ago. So before um, the Cambrian period, basically all the life on Earth was single-celled. Um, that doesn't mean that it was boring. There's lots of cool stuff going on in that period when life first started. But in terms of having big, gigantic creatures, 
usually animals and plants and anything that would have existed at that time, um, not that animals and plants did exist at that time, um, were all single-celled organisms. Um, if you want to learn more about single-celled organisms, we actually did a program all about microorganisms a couple weeks ago. But so the life that lived in ancient Michigan at that time, which as you can see was basically just covered in water, um, is going to be algae. And so I have an example of fossilized algae right here. And this is actually found in the Upper Peninsula. Um, the Upper Peninsula has some of the oldest rocks that we're able to find. It's got some Precambrian rocks that have some of the oldest fossilized life. Um, so this is uh, fossilized algae that was found in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So I'm going to add that to my map or to my, to my diagram right here. And I'm going to add that to the Archaean Proterozoic period because that's when fossilized algae first would have been around. Now, once the, this period was over and we get into the Cambrian, things really start shooting off. Um, so once we get into the Cambrian period, there was something that was called the Cambrian explosion. Um, and the Cambrian explosion basically just meant that there was an explosion of all sorts of really cool life that started to appear in the fossil record and started to appear in the Earth's history. Um, so when we look at the Cambrian period in the PaleoMap data set, you'll see we've got Michigan right over here. Um, it's still covered in water. And this is going to be a really common theme for Michigan for a lot of its history, um, is that Michigan actually used to be kind of a warm ocean sea um, for a lot of its history. And we'll get into some of the cool stuff that we can find because of that um, in just a second. So with Michigan being, you know, such a warm, open inland sea, um, we had all sorts of cool life that started to appear. And it was kind of like an ancient coral reef. Um, so some of those things were brachiopods, um, which are kind of like clams. They're, they're similar in shape to them. They have shells. Um, there were cephalopods, which are things like octopus and squid. There are gastropods, which are basically snails. And there were trilobites. Um, I'll talk a little bit about each of those in turn. So we'll talk about brachiopods first. Um, I have an example of a brachiopod right here. Um, and you might have seen these fossilized before. They're pretty common fossils you might be able to find. And like I said, they look kind of like a clam. They've got this shell on them, um, but they're not clams. They're related to them, but they're not quite. Um, one cool thing about brachiopods, they appeared during the Cambrian explosion, which was 500 million years ago. But brachiopods are actually still around today. You can still see them in modern oceans. Um, they've changed a little bit, but not much. You can see that this image is um, a picture of a modern brachiopod. Um, so brachiopods are still around today. You could still see them if you went snorkeling or if you went looking for them, um, which is pretty cool. Um, another thing that was around in the ancient ocean were cephalopods. Um, so those are things like octopus and squid. Um, these octopus and squid, you would recognize as cephalopods, but they looked a little bit different. You can see um, in this picture here that these cephalopods had shells. Um, they had these really long, straight shells um, that you don't usually see on, on cephalopods nowadays. The only thing that might have a shell, the only cephalopod that does have a shell right now on the outside is a nautilus. Um, so these cephalopods you would have recognized, but they would have looked a little bit different. One thing that you definitely would have recognized from this period, though, are the gastropods or the snails. Um, so these are ocean snails. They might look a little bit different than our land snails, like I have pictured right here. But you can recognize, if you look at this shell, this is a snail shell. Uh, snails have looked pretty similar for a very long time. Um, this is a fossilized snail shell. Um, one cool thing about snails that you might not actually know is that snails can be left or right-handed. Um, so their shells are going to twist one way or the other. Um, both shells that I have right here twist to the left, um, but there are some snails that will uh, twist to the right as well. Um, so it's kind of a cool, fun thing if you're looking at snail shells. So we had gastropods as well, but one of the main things to appear during the Cambrian explosion and one of the coolest things, in my opinion, to appear during the Cambrian explosion were trilobites. Um, trilobites you might have heard of before. Trilobite uh, means three bits or three lobes. Um, and basically that just means because their body had three segments. Um, they might look like bugs, but they're not bugs. They're uh, related to things like lobsters and crabs, but they're closest related to actually the horseshoe crab. Um, trilobites aren't around anymore, of course, but horseshoe crabs still are. Um, and you can see this horseshoe crab actually looks kind of similar to a trilobite. 
Um, you might not think it looks much like the picture there, but if I look up or hold up a fossil of a trilobite, you can see they're pretty similar looking. Um, trilobites were super diverse. They wouldn't always be this gigantic size. This is one cool trilobite fossil that I have. Um, a lot of them that you'll find in Michigan are going to be a lot smaller, um, or tend to be a lot smaller. So I have a smaller trilobite fossil right here that is similar to one that you should be able to find in Michigan. And so I'm gonna lay down that trilobite fossil right there. And one of the other reasons that trilobites were so cool um, is because they had a lot of interesting adaptations that other things didn't have. Um, so we talked about in the history of the earth, uh, life used to be kind of single-celled and simple. Um, but in this period, you can see things are starting to develop shells. Um, brachiopods have shells, cephalopods have shells, snails have shells, and the trilobites have shells too. Uh, and the reason for this is because things are starting to come along that have teeth that are interested in eating all the little soft-bodied critters that are existing. Um, and so it's really important for these animals to start developing shells and start developing some really cool, uh, some really cool adaptations to survive in their environment. And so after the Cambrian comes the Ordovician, um, which is going to be right above it on our chart here. Uh, the Ordovician had a lot of really similar life. Um, so even though these periods were 100 million, or the Cambrian period was about 100 million years, um, life was able to survive in a similar way for a long time. So the Ordovician still had brachiopods, still had gastropods, still had trilobites, all of that good stuff. But the Ordovician did have uh, one other thing that appeared, um, which is a pretty cool creature. And that's going to be a crinoid. Um, so I have a crinoid stem right here, and you'll see crinoid stems fossilized a lot in Michigan. Um, they're pretty simple looking fossils, just kind of these straight tubes that are covered in lines. Um, and crinoids are super interesting. They're also called sea lilies. And as you can see by this picture, crinoids are actually still around today too. Um, they were able to survive for a very, very long time throughout the Earth's history. Um, the crinoids are super interesting. You look at them and you might think that it looks kind of like an underwater plant, but this is actually an animal. They're related to jellyfish. Um, and you can see they have kind of a long stalk and at the end is this huge mass of tentacles. They're all waving in the water. Um, and crinoids are super cool that they are able to kind of exist like this. They look like underwater flowers, but they're actually a type of animal. So I'll put our crinoid stem right here in the Ordovician. And we can move on to our next period, which is the Silurian. So the Silurian, again, has a lot of the same stuff that the other periods had. Um, you can see it right here, Michigan is still underwater in this period. It's a pretty shallow, warm sea, so this is starting to get more and more like a tropical coral reef that might actually be pretty fun to snorkel in. Um, it's got all sorts of cool life, and again, this period had something new that appeared, and that new thing were corals. So the main type of coral that appeared during this period is going to be a horn coral, which I have right here. Um, and you can also see them in the images behind me. Now horn corals, unfortunately, aren't around anymore. Horn corals went extinct. Um, you can see the horn corals are really cool. They have this base that often gets fossilized, and then on top of them, they also had all sorts of really cool tentacles that would be kind of undulating, kind of like our crinoids or our sea lilies. Um, so horn corals are super interesting, but unfortunately not around anymore. So we can put our horn coral there in the Silurian. Um, we can move on to our next period. So the next period after the Silurian is going to be the Devonian. Now the Devonian, again, you can see in Michigan, still covered in water, but the Devonian was a really cool age for a lot of different things. Um, so again, the Devonian still had brachiopods, so we can put a brachiopod down there. The Devonian still had crinoids, so we can put our crinoids down there. Um, they still had all sorts of different stuff that you're familiar with seeing. But there was also a huge explosion of life that occurred in the Devonian in terms of fish. So the Devonian is usually called the age of fishes because all sorts of cool fish started to appear. Um, and one of those types of fish happened to be sharks. Uh, so there's all sorts of cool sharks that you're able to find in the Devonian period. Um, and I have a little fossilized shark tooth right here that we can put down in the Devonian period because the Devonian was the age of fish. And of course, I would be completely remiss not to mention 
that uh, the Devonian period and um, a little bit of the, the Silurian period before it was also the age of one of Michigan's most famous fossils, which is the Petoskey Stone. So Petoskey Stones, um, you might not actually know unless you're in the know, um, Petoskey Stones are a type of fossilized coral. So that's a type of coral called Hexagonaria. And you can see, if you look at the Petoskey Stone, that it has all sorts of cool hexagonal markings on it. Um, if you've ever seen a coral when you're snorkeling in a coral reef, you've seen a picture of a coral before, those might be familiar to you. Um, each of those is a little kind of cell inside the coral body. But once corals got fossilized, um, they eventually got wore down, worn down by all of the, the pounding of the waves of our Great Lakes. Um, so when we find Petoskey stones, they don't usually look like coral anymore. Usually they'll be a lot, uh, a lot nicer and a lot smoother. Um, and then usually when people sell them as Petoskey stones, they'll get all nice and polished too. So it looks a little bit like a coral, but unless you know, you might not know. So we can put our Petoskey stone down here in the Devonian and the Silurian. And there are also, of course, lots of other uh, types of fossil life that was living there as well. Um, there are also creatures called favocytes, and I have a couple of those right there that look pretty similar to coral. So we can add those to our Devonian period. Now, um, after this period uh, is going to be uh, the Carboniferous, which is the next big one. And you can see Michigan is finally not underwater anymore. Michigan's finally covered in land. It's only been several hundred million years of being underwater, but finally Michigan has dried out. Um, during this period, Michigan was still pretty swampy. Um, and the Carboniferous is really cool because it's one of the first periods that has massive amounts of plants on land. So as the land dried up in Michigan, Michigan started to be covered in plants. And the reason that this period is called the Carboniferous is because there was so much plant matter that was growing and then dying and then eventually becoming fossilized or turned into fossil fuels um, that when you're digging through this period, you'll see there's all sorts of carbon in the layer. Um, from those plants. So that's why it's called the Carboniferous. And so usually Carboniferous is going to be really good for finding uh, ancient plant matter like coal, for instance. Um, so the Carboniferous is going to be a great period for that. Put that coal right down on our diagram. Now, unfortunately, after this period, the fossil record of Michigan is not great. Um, for a long time throughout these periods, you can see that all of these layers are being laid down throughout the history of the Earth. Um, but rocks don't have to be laid down constantly. Rocks, like I've said at the beginning of the program, are constantly moving and changing. Um, and sometimes, instead of being laid down, rocks are actually being eroded away. And this is what happened for a big period of Earth's history after the Carboniferous period. Um, the materials and the, the conditions just weren't right for rocks to be laid down in Michigan during this period. So we don't have a really great record of the history of Michigan uh, from the Permian up until about the Pliocene, which is all the way up at the top here about 5.3 million years ago. So this whole huge section, we don't have great fossil records for. But we do have some. Um, if I go back to my map of Michigan here, put it up behind me, you'll see that you know there aren't great records from these periods. Um, but there are some rocks that are available. The problem is they're just not on the surface. So for instance, we do have some records of Jurassic fossils um, here in Michigan, but it's mostly Jurassic pollen. And the reason for that is because the Jurassic rock isn't on the surface, it's way below the surface. So if we're looking for fossils, you have to drill down really far in order to get to them. Um, so we can know some stuff about what the history of Michigan was like during that period, but we don't have a lot of great information. Now, this unfortunately means, as you might have jumped ahead of me and realize, um, unfortunately means that we don't have any records of dinosaurs in Michigan. We do not have any dinosaur fossils that we've ever found in Michigan. Now, we know that Michigan was mostly land during this time, so we can assume that dinosaurs probably lived here during the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods. Um, those are the periods that dinosaurs were alive. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any records of them living here, so we don't know for sure what types of dinosaurs might have lived here, um, but we do know that they probably did live here anyway. 
So I have a couple of dinosaur fossils here that we can put down on our map, even though we haven't found any dinosaur fossils in Michigan. Um, this is a T-Rex tooth, for instance. You can tell it's a T-Rex tooth because of how big it is. It's almost the size of my face. Um, one of my favorite things is to compare the size of this tooth. It's about the size of a banana. Um, and this is just one tooth of a T-Rex. T-Rex was an apex predator. Um, it ate anything that it could. Um, a lot of scientists believe that it was probably a really strong predator and also a scavenger, um, but still it could have taken down pretty much anything that it wanted to, to survive. Um, so I'm going to put down our T-Rex tooth during this period. Of course, there were other dinosaurs around during this period as well. Um, I have another example of a dinosaur, and this was not a dinosaur from the United States, but this is a Protoceratops. Um, you can see Protoceratops was really cool. It was related to dinosaurs like Triceratops. They're part of the same group. Um, you can see because it's got this big frill. Um, so again, Protoceratops wouldn't have lived in Michigan, but it's a cool dinosaur anyway. So we can maybe put that one down right here on our diagram. So after this period, like I said, there's not a lot of great rocks that we can find in Michigan up until around the Pleistocene. But luckily, the Pleistocene has some really, really cool fossils that we're able to see. And so you might notice, if we go back to our map of Michigan, that Pleistocene isn't listed on this list. Um, Pleistocene isn't an era that has a whole layer of rock that we're able to go and explore. But that's because the Pleistocene was pretty recent. Um, so the Pleistocene rocks that we're able to find in Michigan are going to be directly on the surface. Um, they're going to be just little patches of things that we can find here and there. Um, but there's one Pleistocene mammal that you've probably heard about people discovering in Michigan that is a mastodon. So mastodons are actually Michigan state fossil. And you might have heard about people discovering mastodons. It doesn't happen that frequently, but a lot of times uh, when farmers are digging into a field or people are doing a construction project, uh, you might find ancient mastodon bones. Um, so mastodons are really um, a fossil you can find uh, quite a bit in Michigan. Um, but along with those are also mammoths. Now mammoths, you're not going to find quite as often in Michigan. They usually live a little bit further south. Um, you can see, looking at the picture behind me, they look pretty similar, um, but they do have some distinct differences. And one of those main differences is going to be what they eat. So I have their teeth right here. This one's a mastodon, this one's a mammoth. Um, so we'll start off looking at the mastodon. If you look at these ridges up on top, you can see that the mastodon had these really large lobes or bumps. And that's actually what mastodon means. It means lobed tooth. Um, the reason the mastodon had all of these lobes on its teeth uh, was because of what it ate. So mastodons would have eaten all sorts of twigs and leaves and really kind of heavy plant materials that it had to grind through with its teeth and it had to really like, kind of chop it up. Um, so it needed these big bumps to be able to smash through all that material. Now mammoths, on the other hand, wouldn't eat materials like that. They would eat mostly grasses. So mammoths had these kind of tiny thin ridges up on top. And the reason was because mass, or mammoths would be grinding their teeth together um, in order to grind all that grass up in order to eat it. Um, another thing you can notice, of course, by the teeth is that mammoth teeth are shaped kind of weirdly. They've got kind of this big triangle, whereas mastodons have these more normal looking roots. So we'll put our mammoth right down here in the Pleistocene and our mastodon right down here in the Pleistocene. Now that's not the only type of fossil that you're going to find in Michigan. There's lots of other cool Pleistocene life that's been discovered in Michigan. Those are just the only fossils I have access to. But I do have a fun kind of bonus fossil. Um, if you remember last week's program when we talked about trace fossils, uh, trace fossils are fossils that aren't directly from an animal. It's not a bone or a tooth that's being preserved or it's not the leaf of a plant, but it's something left behind by an ancient organism. Um, so I also have a copy of a Pleistocene poop or a coprolite um, that we can also put down in the Pleistocene. Um, we know this came from a Pleistocene mammal, but we don't know which mammal this came from. So we can put that down in the Pleistocene as well. So with that, we can get on to today's activity. Um, so today's activity is kind of a loose one, uh, but it's the idea that you can go out and go fossil hunting. Um, 
I am not the best person to ask uh, advice about how exactly to go fossil hunting. Um, there's lots of great resources available online and in books, um, specifically for fossil hunting in Michigan. One thing that I can tell you though, is that you don't have to go anywhere special to go fossil hunting. Um, you're not necessarily going to find a mastodon or you know you won't find a dinosaur, for instance, in Michigan. Um, but you can find cool Michigan fossils all over the place. Uh, you can find them if you're going to the beach this summer. Um, you might actually be able to find them even in your own driveway. Um, I found a couple of fossils in rocky driveways going to my parents' house or my friend's house. Um, I found them in parking lots. And so if you really know what to look for, you can find fossils pretty much anywhere. Um, but with that in mind, I do have a couple of tips about how to go fossil hunting safely and legally. So first of all, I have the do's, um, so the do's of fossil hunting. So when you do go fossil hunting, first of all, you need to be sure that you know the laws regarding fossil hunting. Um, there are a lot of laws regarding fossil hunting. Um, I'm not a legal expert, so I won't cover them all, but definitely do your research beforehand. Um, one of the main things is the area that you're looking for fossils. You have to make sure that you're legally allowed to be there, make sure that you're not trespassing on either private land or on state or federal land. Um, make sure that you're allowed to collect fossils in the area that you want to collect fossils. Um, and you can look all this information up online or in a lot of great books. Um, but if you are legally allowed to be there and you know what you're allowed to take and what you need to keep, um, the next good thing to do is to bring a fossil ID book. Um, so when you go fossil hunting, if you have your ID book, you're able to tell what you're actually finding. Um, you might find some of the more common fossils, some of the stuff that we talked about today, but you also might find some weird stuff that you can't quite identify. So having a fossil ID book is a great uh, resource to use when you're fossil hunting. Of course, the next step being a museum uh, is one of our favorites. If you find something cool, if you find a really cool fossil or honestly anything else for that matter, any cool animal or plant, um, tell a museum. You can call the, your museum, you can email them. Um, when museums are open, you can bring the thing to a museum um, if you know that there's an expert there who might be able to help you. Um, we have ID days at the MSU Museum. There's Darwin Discovery Day that usually occurs in February and Fossil Day that usually occurs in October. Um, and both of those are ID days where people can bring things in and have them identified by real paleontologists and other scientists. So if you find something cool uh, that you think a museum or science might be interested in, or even if it's just something that you think is cool, you don't know if anyone else would be interested in, be sure to bring it in and let a museum know because we're excited and we want to find, the cool, find out about the cool things that you found. Um, but the most important thing, of course, when you're going fossil hunting is the last do, which is staying safe. Um, this means a lot of different things. Again, like I said, don't trespass, all that good stuff. Um, but also just basic things about taking care of yourself. If it's a hot day, make sure to wear shorts, bring a hat and sunscreen, bring some water. Um, depending on where you're going hunting, there could be all sorts of different stuff happening. Um, Another important thing to remember is to watch out for other people and to watch out for cars. Um, sometimes when you're really excited about fossil hunting, you might not be paying attention to your surroundings. Um, and so it's really important to pay attention to the area that you're fossil hunting in. Um, which brings me, of course, to some fossil hunting don'ts as well. Um, and this is kind of covered in the do's, but make sure when you're fossil hunting that you don't take what you aren't allowed to take. Um, make sure that you aren't trespassing. Um, and also, if you do bring sunscreen or water, make sure that you don't litter when you are in that area. Um, a lot of fossil hunting happens in wild areas like our beaches. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're keeping those areas nice and clean for everyone to enjoy. So that is the end of our fossil program for today, uh, Fossils Part 2. I hope that everyone had a wonderful time learning all about uh, the different types of fossils you can find in Michigan. Um, if you have any questions, of course, you can feel free to reach out to the museum. We have some fantastic paleontologists who work with us. Um, that is uh, the end of the program, though. Uh, so I, of course, want to, uh, again, thank the museum for doing this program, um, and also the Michigan State Federal Credit Union, who were sponsors for Science on a Sphere. Um, I also want to thank all of our community sponsors as well, who helped to sponsor the Science on a Sphere exhibit. Um, and if you're interested, you can actually donate yourself to the Science on a Sphere program and also to all sorts of other great programming that we do to help keep our lights on at the museum, keep our doors open. Um, and I'll have a link to that in the comments where you can donate if you are so inclined. But thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope that everyone has a wonderful rest of your day.